Hi there, I'm going to be talking about half cycle corrections in Markov cohort simulations. So recall that Markov cohort simulations use these things called time cycles. What they are are discrete time intervals. And in our Markov model, we don't explicitly model what happens in between those discrete time intervals. So just to show it on a graph, let's imagine that we have time uh, in months here. And then we have some curve, which is, uh, say, the membership of a state over time. Now, if we have a three month time cycle length, we're only going to capture the membership at each of these points along the curve. So we don't capture the full richness of the curve, if you like. And so the question is, when we come to calculate, well, how many life years were lived in that state or how many qualies were accrued or costs? We have to do something to estimate the area under this curve, given that we only have these uh, small number of points. So if you don't make any adjustment um, and you just take the membership at the start of the cycle and you multiply it by the cycle length, then you'll get something that looks like this. And you'll see that we are uh, repeatedly overestimating how much uh, time is being accrued, particularly if you look here and here, big overestimations. On the other hand, if we use uh, the end of the cycle, then we're going to end up with significant underestimation. And so what has typically been done uh, in Markov cohort simulations is something called a half cycle correction, which is where you can kind of imagine um, for the first cycle, we just halve its length and then we shift everything back by half a cycle. And now you can see that we're much closer to the true area under the curve. So this is called a half cycle correction and it's really simple to do because all you're really doing is dividing the area in the first and also the last cycle by two and everything else stays the same. So as I just said, the first and the last cycles only count for half a cycle. And that's effectively assuming that the transitions occur midway through each cycle. And as I said, those calculations can be quite simple. There are other options which are based on numerical, numerical integration methods. Typically, you would be looking at the trapezoidal rule, which is sometimes termed the life table method when it's used in these simulations. And there's the Simpsons rule, which is rarely used, and I'm not going to go into any further detail on it. The trapezoidal rule uh, does something like this, which is where it connects by a straight line between these points uh, and then calculates the area underneath that piecewise linear function. And it's called the trapezoidal rule because each cycle we use the formula for the area of a trapezoid to calculate this. Now, what difference does it make whether we use that half cycle correction or some other method? Well, if we're only calculating life years lived and there's no discounting, then the half cycle correction and the trapezoidal method will give identical results. So here's how uh, you would calculate for both of them. We've got um, a model with a number of cycles and we have already calculated the membership at the start of each cycle, which is denoted X zero. Um, the model is running for 100 cycles, so we don't really want to see what happens uh, in the 100th cycle. That's more for us to know what's happening right at the end of the 99th cycle. With the half cycle correction method, we leave almost all of those numbers unchanged and we just halve the first and the last cycle. And then the total you'll see at the bottom is given by this formula. So that first cycle and the last cycle both divided by two. So if you look here, we've got the same formula is used in every cycle. And what we calculate is an adjusted membership where the adjusted membership in cycle zero is the average of the calculated membership in cycle zero and cycle one, and so on and so forth. And so the formula you get is down here. These are actually the same. If you work it out, you get the same answer for the total, but you've got different numbers in each cycle. 
And so let's imagine that we have an actual model here. We've calculated numbers. We start off with a thousand people. It, with the half cycle correction, we would say there were only 500 in that first cycle. And then we continue down and in that final cycle, instead of 27, we halve it and we get 13. With the trapezoidal method, each one of these is different from our initially calculated membership, but they add up to the same at the bottom, the half cycle correction and the trapezoidal method. So I've just shown that it doesn't make a difference when you're calculating life years and there's no discounting. Um, so naturally you think, when does it make a difference? Well, it's when you're calculating things like costs and qualities and those payoffs can differ per cycle or when we're including discounting, these methods can give different results. So let's have that example again, the same membership that we had previously. And an important thing to remember about that was that 91% of the cohort survived the first cycle. We'll say that that's a one month cycle length and the costs are $2,000 in the first month and $200 thereafter. And we are in accruing qualies with a quali weight of 0.6 in the first month, 0.8 thereafter. And in this example, we won't include any discounting. So here we've got uh, the costs in the first two columns according to the two methods and the qualies in the last two columns according to the two methods. Now, the thing that you will notice that is glaringly obvious is that with the half cycle correction, we're only incurring a cost of $1 million compared to a cost of $1.9 million with the trapezoidal method. But we know that most people survived the first month and all of them should have accrued the $2,000 cost. So 1,000 people, $2,000, we should be much closer to the 2 million mark than the 1 million mark. And that doesn't get picked up anywhere later. And so we see overall a very significant underestimation of the costs. That's a complete failure of the half cycle correction method. It's drastically underestimated the costs and it's also overestimated the qualities. So my take home message is just don't use that simple half cycle correction. It's not worth it. Now, if you're thinking about using a model with tunnel states, um, you might get a bit confused what to do with your half cycle corrections. So just a quick recap. Tunnel states let us relax the Markov assumption and track the number of cycles that have been spent in a state. And we use this to determine the transition probabilities and payoffs. Half cycle thinking can make things confusing when your model includes tunnel states. You might ask yourself, how long should we assume people have been in a state when you're calculating transition probabilities and payoffs? You know, did they enter this state half a cycle ago? And my advice is just keep it simple. Assume that they just entered and those half cycle adjustments will come later. So here's an example of a model with tunnel states. We've got a healthy state, this diseased state here, which has tunnel states denoted there. And then we have an absorbing state, which is death. This is a very common model structure, and for now we're just going to focus on that diseased state which had the tunnel states. And let's imagine that the log normal distribution fits crude disease survival well. And so here's a, a picture of the survival in that disease state. So most people survive for a year, but then there's a quick drop off in survival and very few people survive to four or five years. If you're interested, the parameters for that log normal distribution are both 0.5. So we decide in this case that our cycle length is three months and we have tunnel states up to five years. Uh, that means four cycles per year for five years, we're going to have 20 tunnel states. The first tunnel state is referring to the time spent zero to three months post disease diagnosis. The second tunnel state is three months to six months post diagnosis. After five years, there are very few survivors and the transition probabilities are fairly stable, so we don't need to add any more tunnel states. And let's imagine that in this diseased state, 
uh, your costs are $2,000 in the first year, but $200 thereafter. And importantly, this is your first year post-diagnosis, not first year from the model starting. So let's look at the different states we have in our model. We have a healthy state. We're not tracking any payoffs in here, so let's just give it a cost of $0 per cycle. And people are entering the diseased state at a rate of 0.1, or with a probability of 0.1 each cycle. And they're dying with transition probability 0.02. Now I'm showing the first five disease tunnel states. The first four refer to within the first year because there are four cycles per year. So the cost per cycle in those first four tunnel states is going to be $500 and thereafter it's going to be $50. We calculate these transition probabilities of going on to the next tunnel state uh, for the diseased state. These start off very high because if you go back, you'll see that most people are surviving this first year. But these do uh, diminish over time. And then we eventually reach our kind of steady state uh, for being in the disease state uh, where you have a 0.786 probability of remaining in that state each cycle. OK. Showing all of the 20 tunnel states and the one um, final state, the steady state for diseased, uh, would make this graph really much too messy. So I've just grouped together in red, we have where your one year post diagnosis, so those first four states, and then in this light green, it's when you are over one year post diagnosis. Okay. So let's say that these are the state memberships that we've just seen and just focusing on the people in the diseased states and whether they have been less than a year or more than a year. Okay, so in the first cycle, nobody is in the diseased state at all because everybody starts in the healthy state. And then you start to see over time, people are entering this diseased state and eventually reaching uh, the long-term disease state. Now what we do with the trapezoidal method is exactly what we've been doing all along, is we calculate this adjusted state membership as the average of the current cycle and the next cycle, or if you like, the membership at the start and the end of a cycle. So at the start of this cycle the membership was zero, but at the end of the cycle it was 100, therefore our adjusted state membership for that cycle is 50. And you'll see it's also slightly brought forward the membership of the long-term diseased state. Okay, and then we calculate our costs accordingly. So everybody who is in the um, diseased short-term disease state is going to be incurring costs at five hundred dollars per cycle. And if they're long-term diseased, it's going to be $50 per cycle. And so you'll see that most of the costs come from that short-term disease state, but there is a small contribution from the longer-term disease state. So to conclude, although the standard half-cycle correction looks simple, it can get the answer quite wrong. The trapezoidal method, which is also called the life table method, is easy to use and is the recommended method. And be careful not to let half cycle thinking creep in when you're calculating transition probabilities and payoffs, especially when you're using tunnel states.